Hey everyone, welcome back to our YouTube channel. My name is Vince, this is my partner George, and together we are WRX Property Group. So before we get started, if you learned something new in this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to keep getting updates. And if you would like to connect with either of us to chat about your real estate plans, there is a link below in our bio where you can schedule a quick call. So today's topic, we're going to be breaking down the newly developed RICO information guide. RICO stands for Real Estate Council of Ontario, and they developed this guide on December 5th, 2023. And basically it's intended for buyers and sellers to help them make informed decisions. So this guide contains information that you as a client should be aware of before you enter into an agreement with the brokerage or before you receive services from a real estate agent. Okay, so let's go through this together. Page one starts off with providing us a breakdown of what's contained in the guide. So this includes uh, working with a real estate agent, knowing the risks of representing yourself, signing a contract with a real estate brokerage, understanding multiple representation, and if needed, how to file a complaint. Yes, and there is a legal advisor in here. Basically, it says that the guide is intended to help you make an educated decision, but this guide is in no way to be a replacement for legal representation or legal advice. So if you do need advice on a legal issue, you should still contact an independent representative to protect your interests. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Agents in Ontario must be registered, which requires completing the necessary education and carrying consumer deposit insurance, as well as professional liability insurance. Real estate agents, they provide valuable information, advice and guidance to buyers and sellers, and they navigate the complexities of the real estate transaction. So if you are a seller, a real estate agent can advise you on how to market your property, on what the current market conditions are, pricing your home, actually go out there and market the property for you, arrange showings for buyers, help you in terms of negotiating offers to protect your interest, help you navigate the tricky waters of multiple offers, and then of course, guide you through all the paperwork to ensure that you have a successful closing in the transaction. And as a buyer, an agent can you know, assist you with getting pre-approvals for financing so you know how much you can afford, make you aware of any tax exemptions that you may be eligible for. They can share information about neighborhoods, set up showings for you so you can see the properties in person. They can advise you on the best strategy to use when it comes to competing offers and also negotiate for you to get the best price terms and conditions for you. And of course, they can also provide you with referrals to other professionals that you might need. People like real estate lawyers or mortgage brokers, they can get you in touch with them. So moving on to page three of this guide. Uh, so here we're talking about things that you will benefit from, which are the duties the brokerage and agent owe to you as a client. So the first one is undivided loyalty. So when you're being represented by a real estate agent or their brokerage, they have undivided loyalty to you. You are their top priority. Everything they do is in your best interest. They're not supposed to reveal any information that goes against that, and they're only allowed to act in a way that benefits you. Number two is disclosure. So they have to tell you everything about the transaction that they know or anything that might impact your decision through this process. Yeah, and we'll touch on unrepresented parties, but this is a big one when it comes to unrepresented parties is if you are not being represented by the agent or the brokerage, they don't have to disclose information to you that they would if you were being represented. So the next one is confidentiality. Your information cannot be shared with anyone outside of the brokerage without your specific written consent, unless of course it's legally required by law. And lastly, real estate agents need to avoid any conflicts of interest. So that includes avoiding any situation that would affect their duty to act in your best interest. Now, you also have some responsibilities as the client. First of all, you need to be clear about exactly what you want and what you don't want in your home search. You wanna make sure that you're sharing all information that might be relevant. You also need to respond to your agent's questions in a timely manner. And you need to be aware of the terms of the agreement that you sign with the brokerage. 
And lastly, you'll need to pay the fees that you agreed upon. We'll touch on that on page seven. And even if the agreement to buy or sell later falls through due to your neglect or default, then you would need to pay these fees. But we'll break this down in more detail on page seven. On to page four of the guide, knowing the risks of representing yourself. And this is directly from the guide itself. If you are involved in a real estate transaction and are not a client of a real estate brokerage, you are considered a self-represented party. This means that you have chosen to represent yourself, which has different rights and responsibilities. Very few buyers or sellers make this choice, and that's because there are significant risks representing yourself in a transaction if you do not have the knowledge and expertise required to navigate the transaction on your own. If you choose not to work with a real estate agent, it's going to be your responsibility to look after your own best interests and protect yourself. This may include things like making inquiries about zoning, permitted property use, or any other aspect of the property, determining what you believe to be the value of the property if you're buying or selling, and determining how much you're willing to offer or accept, and preparing all of the documents. Remember, in this situation, the agent is working for another party in this transaction. So they are representing the best interests of their seller in the transaction and everything they do or that they disclose to you, that they discuss to you, what they have in mind is their client's best interest, not your best interest. Also be aware that that agent is obligated to share anything that you tell them with their client that might be to their benefit. So this includes things like the minimum price that you're willing to pay for the property or your motivation for buying or selling the property and among others. So just to quickly summarize, this is what happens if you do choose to represent yourself and what you should be aware of because the other real estate agent will not be acting in your best interest. So in other words, an agent cannot provide you with services, opinions or advice if you choose to represent yourself. Any assistance that the agent does offer to you is a service to their client, not you, is in the best interest of their client, not you, and is to help their client sell or buy a property. In this scenario, the agent must provide you with the RICO disclosure and self-representation form and walk you through it before offering any assistance. So you have the right to change your mind and become a client of the brokerage at any point in the transaction. Yeah, so basically if you started off as a self-represented party and then once you've started doing it, you're like, oh boy, I've got myself in a situation where I don't know what the heck I'm doing, you can change your mind and ask to have representation from that point on. And speaking of that, the next page actually goes into some more details about what it's like to sign a contract with a real estate brokerage. So let's flip to page six. So reading from page six, when you become a client, you sign a representation agreement with the brokerage, a contract between you and the brokerage for real estate services and representation. If you don't want to sign an agreement, you shouldn't expect a real estate agent to provide you with any services like showing you homes. Now, these agreements can include buyer representation agreements or seller representation agreements or otherwise known as listing agreements. So there are two types of agreements that you can sign with these new rules, the brokerage agreement or designated representation agreement. A brokerage agreement means that everybody in that real estate brokerage is representing you, whereas a designated agreement means one or a few of the agents within the brokerage who are listed on the agreement are representing your interest. So one thing to keep in mind is that with designated representation, it reduces the likelihood of multiple representation. And we'll dive into that a little bit later in this video. So there's a few things that you should keep your eye out for when you're looking at these representation agreements. The agreement should describe the duties owed to you, the services you'll receive, your rights and responsibilities, what you will pay, and specific terms of the agreement, including how long the agreement is and whether you can cancel it. So key things to look for are the name of your designated representative. Uh, if you're a seller, it'll have information about your property. If you're a buyer, it'll indicate either a specific property that the agent is representing you for or a geographic area, for example, a single family home in the Waterloo region, or if you're looking for a cottage within a specific region. 
Uh, so these are things to look out for when you're signing the agreement. Yeah, so if you are looking at buying a house, let's say in the city and also a cottage outside of the city, you want to make sure that that's written in the geographic location and the scope of the agreement. So that way you have two separate agents representing you at two separate locations. That way you avoid that overlap for the geographical area. So the importance of the scope is that it needs to be clear in order to avoid disputes about who is being paid for each transaction. So in this example that Vince gave, where you're looking for a cottage within a specific region and then a home within Waterloo region, if you just had a generic scope that said, I'm representing you for purchasing a home in Ontario and you buy the cottage with a different agent, then you're actually responsible for paying both of the agents. Whereas when you have the specific scope of I'm looking with you in Waterloo region, I'm looking with this other agent in a different region, then depending on where you buy the home, that's who gets paid and there's no disputes about it. A lot of people sign an agreement that says they're representing them in Ontario for like six months and then you lose contact with a realtor, buy a property with another realtor and suddenly this original realtor comes back and says, hey, I've got an agreement here that says you're still responsible to me during this time period for all of Ontario. Also to look for is the services included. So these will be written out typically in Schedule A of your agreement and it lays out everything that the real estate agent will be doing for you as part of this representation agreement. Uh, so this is a change in the representation agreements to what they used to be before the new rules came into play. And it's really important because a lot of people were having issues where agents would promise all these different things that they would do for them, especially when it came to marketing their home. And then they wouldn't actually deliver on them. And these items were never laid out. So now when your real estate agent says, I'm going to advertise on Facebook, I'm going to advertise on YouTube, you'll get staging, you'll get professional photography. This is all actually outlined in the agreement. Everybody signs off on it. And if they're not delivering on those things, now you have the right to cancel the agreement. The payment amount and terms are also set out in the agreement. So you and the brokers decide on the amount that you will pay for the services. You can agree to a fixed dollar amount or a percentage of the sale price or a combination of both. So as a seller, uh, the amount that you agree to pay is outlined in the agreement. And so this will cover what you pay the listing brokerage and what portion of that, if any, the listing brokerage is allowed to offer the buyer's brokerage. And then also what happens if the listing brokerage enters into multiple representation and if there is a different agreement for commission where the agent represents both parties. Now for buyers, same rules apply. It'll outline exactly how much the brokerage is being paid, how much you agree to pay. Um, but one important aspect is that typically the seller's brokerage will cover the fees for the buyer's brokerage. However, if you sign an agreement that says that you will pay the buyer's brokerage let's say two and a half percent commission and the seller's brokerage is only willing to cover two percent of that then you as the buyer would be responsible for paying that half a percent of commission difference to the buyer's brokerage so a few more things to look out for in your agreement uh, the next one is termination provision so the agreement will outline under which circumstances you can terminate the agreement um, it will outline what happens if there's multiple representation. So you do have to consent to multiple representation. You don't have to enter into a multiple representation agreement. It'll outline how things will change if you do not wish to enter that. And then if you have a designated representative, you can't just be passed off to somebody else without your written consent. So if your representative is away on vacation and they'd like somebody else at the brokerage to help out, if they're not listed in the agreement, you do have to provide written consent to agree to that. Also to look out for is the expiry date. So the expiry date must be clearly written on the first page and the duration of the agreement can vary. This is something that you and your agent will come up with together. So you wanna be aware of exactly when that contract is going to expire and consider your preferred term length. Do you wanna be only in the contract for one month, three months, six months? It's up to you and you can negotiate this with your agent. So the next one is the holdover clause. So this one requires payment of the agreed upon terms for a transaction that occurs after the agreement expires. So this is also negotiable, but typically what you'll see for holdover periods is anywhere 30 to 60 days. So an example of how this works and what it means. Let's say that we have entered into an agreement together to purchase a house for you. 
I showed you a property at 123 Banana Street during our uh, contract. You decided it wasn't for you at the time. Our contract expires a few days later. And then within the 30 day holdover period, you actually decide that you do want to purchase that property. Well, what the holdover period says is that as long as we showed it to you during our agreement and it's within the holdover period time, our agreement is still valid and you would have to work with us on purchasing that property and the fees payable would be the same as what they were when they were initially signed and outlined in the agreement. So let's move on to the next page now, which is page nine, understanding multiple representation. So multiple representation means a designated representative or brokerage represents more than one client in a transaction. Now this can happen in different ways depending on the type of representation agreement that you or other clients have within the transaction. In the scenario of brokerage representation, a multiple representation happens when two agents from the same brokerage are representing the buyer and the seller. So for example, Vince could be representing the seller, I could be representing the buyer. If they're both under brokerage agreement, that means Keller Williams is representing both of them and it is multiple representation. Now in the case of designated representation, multiple representation would only occur if the same agent was representing the seller and the buyer or two buyers in the same transaction. So as an example, if I had a client that was the seller and George had a client that was the buyer, multiple representation is not in effect. It would only be in effect if I was representing the buyer and I was representing either another buyer in the transaction or the seller as well. So this goes back to our earlier point about the difference between designated and brokerage representation when it comes to multiple representation. You can see how in a designated representation agreement, multiple rep is far less likely to happen. And just as a reminder, multiple representation is not permitted unless both of the clients agree to it in writing. The representative must treat each of the clients involved in an objective and impartial manner. They cannot maintain undivided loyalty to you or promote and protect your interest over the interests of the other client and cannot offer advice to you about such things as the price you should offer or accept or terms of the agreement that should be included in the agreement of purchase and sale. Now, before you agree to multiple representation, the brokerage must offer you a written disclosure that explains how their duties to you will change, the differences in the services you will receive, and any change to how much you will need to pay the brokerage. So until this information is disclosed in writing and agreed to by all parties, the brokerage cannot take any further steps with any of the clients. So remember, you can refuse multiple representation and the brokerage or the designated representative cannot proceed. So ask the brokerage or your designated representative about some alternatives. They could either refer you out to another brokerage or in the designated representation scenario, they can find another designated representative to protect your interests in this option. So agreeing to multiple representation changes what the brokerage or the designated rec representative can do, and it can have serious consequences on costs at the end of the day. Now this page also touches on sharing the content of other offers. You may have seen articles or news headlines talking about the open bidding or open offer process. Now, buyers in Ontario who have put an offer on a property have always had the right to know the number of offers that are on that property. As of December 5th, 2023, the sellers have the right to also share additional information about the offer. So if you are a seller, you get to decide how much information, if any, you want to share about the offers that you have received. Now, the job of your real estate agent is to guide you on what the best procedure to do that is. And this is going to depend on market conditions as well as the content of the other offers. So for example, if you choose to share some information about the offers, you don't have to share everything. You can choose to share what the closing dates are of the offers. You can choose to share what the conditions are of the offers. You could choose to share just what the top offer price is. You don't have to share what all of the other offers are, or you can choose to share everything. 
So that's up to you and your real estate agent to decide. And it depends on the conditions of the market and your strategy. Now, the only thing that you can't share as a seller is any personal or identifying information about the buyers. If you're a buyer, you can decide whether you want to participate in a process where the content of your offer might be shared with other buyers. So your agent can help guide you through the steps to take to avoid your content being shared in these scenarios. Now be aware, the seller can make a decision to share the content of offers at any given time. You might not have advance notice, so it's important to talk to your agent and have a game plan going into the offer process. And one of the final pages is what to do about complaints. So if you have a complaint, first contact your brokerage because they will most likely be able to resolve your issue immediately without much trouble. Now, if this does not help resolve the issue, then you can visit the RICO website under their complaint section and file a complaint directly to RICO. And the final page is the acknowledgement. This is where you sign your name and you put down the date saying that the guide has been given to you by your real estate agent and it's been explained to you and you don't have any further questions about it. So there you have it, the new RICO information guide. As a reminder, this is now a requirement for real estate agents to share with any prospective buyers or sellers. We have a link to the guide in the comments, so you can click it and read it at your leisure. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.